Hi everyone, my name is Kate. I am a nurse educator here at Women's Health Network. And um, today we are going to have a discussion about digestion. We get far and away more questions about digestion and digestive concerns probably than anything else um, from the women that we speak with. So um, joining me in the discussion today are um, Dr. Sarika Arora, who is a functional medicine MD, and she is joining us from Boston today. Hi, Sarika. Hello. So glad that you're able to be here with us. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And we also have Sharon Stills. She is a naturopathic MD, and she is joining us from Arizona today. Hi, Sharon. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Yep. It's good to see you, as always. Um, so before we can talk about digestive challenges, I think it's a, a good idea to define kind of what is normal digestion. Sharon, what's normal digestion? Normal. <laughs> Let's see, you know, there's always such a far range of what normal is. I always, when patients say, oh, I have normal digestion or normal bowel movements, I always say, well, define normal because I think often that's important that we do that. So digestion is the process that's associated with when we take in food into our bodies. And so what is actually happening to that food? Because we always think you are what you eat, but it's actually you are not what you eat, but actually what you absorb and what you do with that food. And so food, if it's not properly digested, can actually, even if it's something healthy like broccoli or lettuce or a nice juicy apple, if it's not digested properly, it can actually become a metabolic problem in your body and cause more harm than good. So it's important when we are eating that we're digesting, that stomach acid is being secreted, that pancreatic enzymes and cholecystokinin from the gallbladder and all of these things are happening to break down the bolus of food that so it can actually get absorbed into our body and do some good for us. Okay. I think that's a, a really important distinction to make. We just assume a lot of times if we're eating healthy foods that um, we're doing everything we can for ourselves, you know, when really that's just the first step in a lot of steps that have to take place. So um, so this one I'm going to start with Sarika. Um, how is digestion tied in with hormones? We hear about a lot of digestive complaints that come along with kind of periods of hormonal change. What's going on there? That's a great question. So we know that we need hormone balance for digestive balance. And the hormones that come to mind are, number one, cortisol. So cortisol is our stress hormone. And if there's a lot of stress happening, our cortisol may be high or it may be too low, and that will impact our digestion. So patients may have loose bowel movements, diarrhea, or they may have constipation, where the bowel movements are strained. The second hormone that comes to mind is the thyroid hormone. And we know when the thyroid is sluggish, or if there's Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, that can lead to constipation. So definitely the hormones need to be in balance for supported digestion. Yeah, I think it's really important what Sarika is talking about with cortisol and being our stress hormone and interfering with digestion. And so one of the things that's really key and that we teach patients is that you should be calm and serene when you're eating, that you should be mindful when you're eating and chew your food. And so just the act of being calm and lowering your cortisol is going to help you extract what you need for your food and have it be not a burden but actually go through your system easily. So I'm often known for telling patients, you know, you're eating broccoli and brown rice, but if you're eating it on the run and you're stressed and you're anxious, you may be better off going to McDonald's and having a Big Mac if you're actually doing it from a meditative place and really enjoying your food and being still with it. So I think that's really important that we are in touch with our cortisol levels and our stress when it comes to digestion. I totally, I totally agree. Mindful eating is so important and sometimes my husband and I will play a game and we will see like who is the last one to finish the meal because we know that person's really taking their time. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I, and I've heard, I don't know, was it 
um, the Buddha that said it's better to eat a stone sitting down than a meal standing up. There's <laughs> ancient wisdom, you know, about sitting and focusing on your food. So I think that's something that's really a challenge for a lot of us with the busy schedules that we have, but definitely worth prioritizing. Yeah. Um, so, of course, there can be all kinds of digestive imbalances or areas of imbalance within the, you know, digestive process. Um, one that we hear a lot about and that we get a lot of questions about is leaky gut syndrome. And, um, you know, which we know can manifest in a lot of ways that don't look like digestion, you know. But um, for people who don't know about leaky gut and what that is, um, can you give us a little overview, Sharon? Sure. So when you think about the gastrointestinal tract, it's starting with your mouth, and it's this tube that's going from your mouth to your anus. And so the gastrointestinal tract is actually not really inside the body. It's inside the body, but it's outside the body. It's separate. And so the food that is supposed to get extracted um, and be absorbed you know, that's what the gastrointestinal tract is there for. It's there to protect you from things being absorbed that shouldn't be. So this tube, when it gets compromised, whether it's from stress or overuse of antibiotics or a bacterial infection or eating foods that you're sensitive to, like dairy or gluten, it starts to become leaky and it starts to become permeable. It starts to have gaps. And then food that you're eating can leak through this tube and get into parts of your body where it doesn't belong and so that's the leaky gut and when the food when these proteins are leaking into the system where they don't belong we have this immune reaction and that's where we start to get a lot of problems so leaky gut can manifest as headaches and migraines and joint pain or depression or weight gain so there's a real big variety of how it manifests in your body according to where your weaker links are but it's really important that we have a healthy and non-leaky gut. It's a really good explanation. Um, we can use an analogy that a healthy gut, you want to think of a brick wall where there's no gap and so it represents you know the tight junctions of our colon whereas a stone wall has gaps and then that we call leaky gut. Like she said, the, the food proteins will then go through the tight junctions that are not so tight and then get into our bloodstream causing that immune reaction. Okay. So if somebody thinks that they are struggling with leaky gut or if um, the, you know they they have want to know a little bit more about that from their provider, what should they be doing? Um, how how would you handle that if you were dealing with a leaky gut situation or you want to find out if you are? That's a good question. So the first thing is the symptoms. So like she said, um, I would add to the symptoms like fatigue can be a symptom of that. Any kind of autoimmune process, so MS, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, Hashimoto's, celiac, I mean these are all associated with leaky gut. So the first thing that I would say to address this is the elimination menu plan for people where we take out the known inflammatory foods. So there's gluten, corn, dairy, sugar, soy, and yeast in our foods that we want to remove. So that's the first step. Okay. Yeah, my experience has been that there are tests you can do for leaky gut. There are functional medicine tests that you can do and some of them more accurate than others and as I've practiced so many years I've found it's not as important to do those tests and spend patients money on tests that may not be covered by insurance but like Sarika is saying when you see the symptoms anytime you see someone with an autoimmune process or allergies or whatever it is I've kind of gotten to the place where because it is such a chronic issue for so many people that we start to look at the gut and start to seal up the gut and you can only have good come from that. <laughs> right. <clears throat> and we have, um, I know, a, a couple of really good articles on our website about an elimination diet and how that works. Um, 
I think it's a it's a it's so if anybody wants more information, that's one really good resource. Um, but just googling it, there's a lot of information out there. Um, I think people hear the term elimination diet and get instantly anxious because it sounds like there's nothing left to eat, <laughs> you know, when you, just the word elimination. But it's really kind of a process of elimination, trying to figure out which are, are the foods that you're sensitive to, right? That's right. It doesn't have to be a negative uh, thought at all. And I like to use the term elimination menu plan. So I think that's a more positive term. Right. <laughs> Um, and then what I usually do with my patients is also give them a, a whole list of foods that they can focus on. So a whole list of vegetables, the green leafies, you know, a rainbow of colors on the vegetables, and the list of healthy proteins and healthy fats and uh, gluten-free grains. So I totally give them support. Excellent. I love that switching it up. It's equally as intimidating as the word elimination, I think it's the word diet, or more so, you know, for most people. So that's a great strategy. <laughs> uh, it's it's a double whammy, the elimination diet, but what it's actually doing is it's empowering you as a patient because what you end up doing is turning your body into a laboratory. And so by taking these foods out, you then at some point you can have a choice to add them back in one at a time and see how your body responds and we're all big kids here and then you get to decide is it worth having the headache or the runny nose from eating the gluten and often when I have put patients on elimination diets they feel so good after a short 30 days that when they first started the diet they were like what do you mean I can't have dairy you know I'm gonna go crazy and by the end of the diet I'm like so do you want to try adding dairy in and they're like no way I feel great and it doesn't always have to be that you take everything out I think everyone's individual and a good place for you to start also is just looking at those top food allergens that Sarika was mentioning and maybe you're a dairy addict or maybe you're a gluten addict and because of endorphin release and so forth we often crave and are addicted to the foods that are most damaging to us so if you're sitting here listening and you love cheese and right away when you hear us talking about an elimination diet you think I'm not giving up my cheese you know maybe that's you could just start with that and just take cheese out for 30 days and see what happens in your health so it depends how you are some people are all gangbusters and you just want to take everything out but it can be done one or two items at a time and in my experience with patients gluten and dairy are the big ones and so if you're consuming a lot of gluten and dairy that's a great place to start and I haven't really seen anyone who's taken out gluten and dairy and hasn't had some kind of positive feedback from the experience. Right, we, what we find is that um, sometimes people don't, two things, one, you, sometimes you don't even know how much better you feel until you go well you know it's been three weeks, I'm going to just have some ice cream and then immediately with some kind of a, you know, reaction with the sinuses or whatever, you know, that you didn't, that they didn't anticipate. Um, so that's kind of the, the confirmation for them. Um, the other thing that I always think is very interesting is somebody will come off of, say, gluten, for example, um, because they don't feel digestively like they're tolerating it well or they're getting headaches or something like that and then something they thought was totally unrelated like their eczema or something like that will instantly clear up and to see those light bulbs kind of um, come on is really interesting that's why that's one of the reasons that I always kind of suggest that elimination diet for people um, so I know that we just now just talked a lot about kind of um, you know, steps that women can take when they are struggling with some digestive issues. Um, but are there any specific foods that we should be eating or specific supplements we should be taking um, just to ensure that digestive, you know, optimal digestive health? <clears throat> I think a lot, of, a lot of people think that just eating that yogurt every day is going to solve their, their problem, you know. We see that on TV. So um, what, what else should we be doing? Sorry, 
number one would be a research-based probiotic. So the probiotic is going to have the good gut bacteria. So think of your gut as an empty parking lot. There's all these open spaces, and you want to fill them with the good guys. So there's no room for the bad bacteria. There's no room for yeast. So number one, research-based probiotic, you take, um, so usually on the high-quality ones, you take one a day. Um, the second nutrient, I would say, is an amino acid called glutamine. So glutamine really helps to heal and nourish the gut lining. Those would be my top two. Okay, great. And we, we make those recommendations also, yeah. How about you, Sharon? Um... I have a few also, and I also want to go back and talk about the elimination diet for a second. So as far as supplements, I think absolutely what Sarika said, and also thinking about maybe adding in some hydrochloric acid or some gentiana, which is a bitter herb, to kind of stimulate the digestive juices, or you can use apple cider vinegar. Also maybe using some pancreatic enzymes if you're not digesting your food properly, or even bile salts if you're having problems with fats and gallbladder. So I think it's really looking at what's going on, how, you know, what are your symptoms. A lot of times if you're bloating and belching, you may be low in stomach acid. If you're constipated, you may need those probiotics. I mean, I think everyone needs probiotics, so I think it's just a good overall everyone should be taking a probiotic. And as far as the elimination diet, I just I, I was sitting here thinking that I think it's also something I talk about a lot with patients and I think is really important that it's not just our food, it's what else are we digesting and I think it's important to think about our whole lives and how we digest life and how we digest our experiences and our emotions and our relationships and so often an elimination diet can be complaining from your life or eliminating worry or eliminating anger and so I think they are really tied in with each other as I said at the beginning and so I just wanted to make sure that our viewers who are listening think about that maybe if you're always complaining and you stopped complaining for 30 days you might even find that you tolerate your food better and that you're not having so many symptoms so the mind and body and especially when we're talking about the digestive tract they're so closely related and so I think it's important to keep that in mind too yeah absolutely that's a fantastic point you know we I think so many um, so much of what we're taking, like you said, emotionally, what we're exposed to manifests in very physical ways and we kind of, you know, a lot of people are still looking at the mind and body as very separate systems when um, the closer you look, just the more clear it is how, how one, how we're just one whole being, you know, um, that's important to keep in mind. So. Um, that's all of the questions that we have about digestion today. Um, unless, ladies, did you have any final thoughts that you wanted to share with us? Um, getting back to healing the, the gut and digestion, um, I do follow the, the 4R program that Institute of Functional Medicine discusses for healing the gut. And the 4Rs is number one, remove. So you want to remove any inflammatory food, um, the negative emotions like Sharon just talked about. And when you remove something, you want to replace it. So that's the second R. Replace it with what the body is missing. So whether it be those digestive enzymes, um, like Sharon said, if patients are complaining of bloating after their meals, maybe they don't have enough stomach acid, so you want to give stomach acid with the meals. Um, the next R is re-inoculate. So using those probiotics to re-inoculate the gut flora. And then the last R is repair the gut using the glutamine, using your, your healthy food. Excellent. So the four R's, that's um, something that anybody can look up if they want more in-depth information about that. I'm sure there's plenty out there. Um, but yeah, that's a great, um, great steps to remember. Yeah. So, okay, I think that's 
it for the for our hangout on digestion. Um, Sarika and Sharon, thank you so much for being with us. It's always just so informative and fun when I have a chance to speak with you guys. So um, we really appreciate it. And to everybody watching, make sure you tune back in. We've got more Hangouts on the way. Um, check us out on our YouTube channel or um, on Google+. And um, we will talk to you again soon. Thanks for being with us, ladies. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Thanks.